Latino Americans is supported by member-owned Magic Valley Electric Cooperative, empowering you, empowering your community. Let me introduce our panel for this evening and starting on what would be your far right, Paula S. Gomez, Executive Director of the Brownsville Community Health Center since 1984. The uh, Brownsville Community Health Center is a provider community and migrant health center primarily situated in Brownsville with two school-based clinics and two other satellite clinics as well. The site served almost 22,000 users last year and offered almost 90,000 patient visits during the same year. A Brownsville native, Ms. Gomez has been actively involved in the community health movement, both locally and nationally, for nearly 40 years. For her life's dedication to providing quality, comprehensive health care services to the medically underserved, Ms. Gomez was awarded the Avon Breast Cancer Leadership Award in 1996 and the Luis B. Garcia Award in 1994 and the Texas Community Health Center Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> Sitting next to her is Dr. Manuel Medrano, holds a doctorate from the University of Houston and is professor in the history department here at UT Brownsville. He specializes in Mexican American history and culture. He is a member of the Humanities Texas Board and its Distinguished Speakers Bureau. He has authored three published historical and cultural poetry books about the border, including In Body and Mind, Imágenes, and In the Shadow of My Soul. He also has co-authored a history book with Dr. Milo Kearney entitled Medieval Culture and the Mexican-American Borderlands. Sitting next to him is Mary Mawayo, a senior at the University of Texas at Brownsville, where she is studying history. Throughout her college career, Miriam has sought after professional opportunities to work in immigration and social issues and the legal profession. She has interned at the Southern District of Texas Federal Court and at the law office of Annabel uh, Alegria. For the fall 2012 semester, Miriam was one of the 33 students from the University of Texas system selected for the Archer Fellowship Program. There, she had the opportunity to live in Washington, D.C., an intern with Immigration Equality, a nonprofit organization that represents LGBT and HIV positive immigrant community in the federal sector. In addition to <laughs> as our student expert, she gets the longest introduction. In addition to her experience with the judicial system, Miriam has worked as an on-campus tutor served as a student mentor for the AmeriCorps program and acted as a consultant to the National Park Service. Currently, she works as a youth coordinator with Proyecto, uh, Proyecto Juan Diego, a nonprofit organization that provides education, social and health services to the residents of Cameron Park and surrounding colonias. Her long-term goal is to attend law school and work in a field that helps improve our nation's current immigration policies and help lessen the struggles of undocumented immigrants. And Miriam, some of the youths you work with are here, correct? Some of the youths you work with are here? Yes, they're back there. Are they in the blue or aqua shirts? Yes. Stand up for us, please. All right. And next, to, and next to Miriam is Monica Mercado, who is an instructor of communications at Texas State Technical College in Harlingen. She is also a doctoral student at Our Lady of the Lake University, where she is currently studying leadership studies. 
She received her bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Texas Pan American, where she conducted research studies on the Latin American, on Latin American culture in collegiate settings. Okay. Welcome all. Let me start off here, um, and I'm sure we have much to talk about, and not, not enough time to do it all in. But earlier today, uh, a colleague of mine uh, at the university mentioned that oftentimes when we have documentaries, these kinds of presentations, they're always populated with athletes and movie stars talking about their experiences or talking about the Latino experience, these very general and perhaps somewhat rosy terms, or maybe cliche terms. That certainly isn't the case with this documentary, I think. And I was wondering what your impressions were as scholars and academicians and students about the quality of the documentary and the, um, uh, the perspective which, which they showed. Manuel, why don't you start us off? Sure, well, that's all. Uh, the documentary is, uh, it's organized well uh, for someone that knows very little about the Latino history. Uh, it is a good starting point uh, and it is, um, it includes historians that I respect. Abi Montejano, who's a major historian, was here last spring before 450 students and community people. He has his doctorate from the University of Yale. Uh, his 1986 book, Anglos and Mexicans in the Making of Texas, uh, won the highest award for a history book that year, the following year, which is a Frederick Jackson Turner Award. In the film were also Dolores Huerta, who was here on campus last year, Angel Gutierrez, who was here as part of the leadership. So I think the historians, uh, I serve with uh, uh, De La Teja, who is on the Humanities Texas Board. Uh, the historians are sound. And what this documentary does, it provides a, uh, it's the evolution of the Latino Americans more than anything else, because it begins with the early period and sequentially, and I encourage you to view the other volumes because uh, I viewed uh, the next volume, volume three, which is on the war years. It's to me, my favorite volume. Uh, it has a lot of the information about the Latinos uh, in the war era that served in factories, that served in the battlefields, uh, that uh, came back to conditions uh, less than American, less than democratic, and decided to organize and uh, make their lives better. Among them, Dr. Hector Garcia. And so, uh, it's a sound documentary. Um, it probably is weighted a little bit heavy toward uh, California, New Mexico, but we forgive them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the Texas component is solid. Uh, I would have liked to see a little bit more on the beginning of the U.S.-Mexico War because that's a turning point. That creates the Mexico-Americano. Uh, but generally, I, I enjoyed the film, and it's, it's easy on the eyes, and it's easy on the ears. Uh, you, if you have a little, very little knowledge about it, about it you can still follow uh, the history and enjoy the evening. Yeah. Miriam, as a student, what did you think? Well, I really liked it. Um, I thought that it talked about, it really um, identified or talked about the stories that we could identify with. It really brought up some of the interesting stories that could make us proud of our culture and our history. And I think it's really important to show it to the youth as well because we need to know our history and we need to know that our identity, that we were here long before and to really give us knowledge about who we really are. Monica, you are an instructor of communications. What did the film communicate? Uh, well, I thought it was really well written and, and uh, produced. And um, I think it was interesting, to answer your question, that um, we don't really hear about the discrimination that Latino Americans endured or our ancestors endured. We usually hear about other minority groups who have gone through it and who are still going through it. But we kind of forget the history behind um, how we were seen as a subordinate in our community. And um, I thought it really illustrated pretty uh, nicely that, uh, you know, we have gone a long way from, from now. And, and it, to, um, I kind of just wanted to, to go back and look at a quote that was said in the beginning. Uh, it was a politician who said, we are not here to beg and we're not here to threaten. We're here for an opportunity, right? So uh, sometimes we forget that. And 
often we, we run into these misconceptions about us, right? That we are here to threaten or we are here to beg, but in reality, we're just here to provide people with the resources that we are able to do so, so, yeah. And Paula, let me ask you, as someone who works with uh, the community, what did you think about the documentary and captured some of that voice, at least in this initial stage? That's a loaded question. Yes. <laughs> um, honestly, I, um, I think it's important. I think it's a good tickler for uh, anyone that really is not a historian but lives in the area. Uh, I'm with Dr. Ma Manuel Medrano in terms of I would like to have seen more uh, done on Texas because we left out Galveston, we left out the valley, we left out um, a lot of the things that are very uh, important because we're still dealing with a lot of those issues. We still don't understand in Washington what it means to be living on both sides of the border, which many of our people still do. Mm -hmm. um, they don't understand the market. And I think if some of that history were there, uh, to understand that there were universities in Matamoros long before there were universities in Austin, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, I, I think, you know, we've been put down for so long that we need to start talking about, hey, you know, we, we didn't arrive with the Indians, um, with, with the, uh, I'm sorry, with the settlers from, from Europe. Uh, we were already here. And it's good because they talk about San Antonio and they talk about Houston and they talk about that area, but there's this whole area south. Mm -hmm. They talk about the western part and, and the eastern part of Texas, but, or Mexico at that time, but we were here. And so for me, that part is missing. Uh, some of the dates uh, are not quite as accurate as I remember in, having read a thousand years ago. Um, but I think that for the most part, it does serve as a good tickler for anyone that really wants to dig and, and find out what's the other side of the story. You make a very good point, I think, about this area, the complex dynamic that we experience every day. It's not really understood all the way up uh, no. to Washington and other parts of, of the country. I recall watching, I think it was a, an interview that Charlie Rose was conducting. It was probably on PBS. And the person that he was interviewing, this was maybe 20 years ago, maybe even more, uh, was a very well-respected journalist. I think she had been awarded the Pulitzer Prize. And she made a passing reference to the violence, I think, on the border. And she was dismissing the border area somewhat as being unimportant. She, and I remember very clearly what she said, that sometimes well, the people that cross and go back, usually they just come, they buy refrigerators or stuff like that, and then, and then go back. And I thought, and this was 20, 25 years ago, I said, that's not what people do here. That's not this, that's just totally wrong. I don't care if you won the Pulitzer. I don't care if you're on PBS. I don't care if you're being interviewed. That's just not right. So maybe, maybe we can follow up on that thread a little bit. What, maybe you can speak a little bit to the, the, the social dynamics of this area. And all of you perhaps have something to say. Paula, you can say something about the health, and maybe something about the history and, and the, the social activism of this area? Well, we, it's not a secret that if mm -hmm. something breaks out here, measles mm -hmm. or what have you, mm -hmm. um, it happens in Matamoros as well. Mm -hmm. uh, germs, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, don't carry passports. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have visas. They just go wherever they want to go and they're carried by people as well as um, other things. And so we've, we've had a, a lot of uh, problems. It was interesting to see in the documentary that, um, you know, there, that, that they mentioned just in passing that 
uh, the settlers from Europe brought disease with mm -hmm. them. Uh, and, and I think that uh, it's, it's true here as well. Uh, but there's no mention of the fact that we, uh, we had a lot of that come through here. Um, you know, Baghdad, Baghdad was a, a, a very thriving port of entry as, uh, as large, if not larger, than New York City mm -hmm. for a long time. And we never hear anybody talk about that very much, mm -hmm. unless you're in his class. Right. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the disease is there. You know, we talk about, even now, um, health care is much better on this side than it is on that side. And, and in fact, that's not exactly true. You know, we struggle in the U.S. and in, in, in this area with getting kids immunized. And yet, Mexico, Matamoros, has an, almost a 97% rate of immunization for their kids. Uh, we need to learn from each other. And those of us in the field try to do that. We do get together. Uh, unfortunately, there's rules on both sides of the border that say if you're talking to each other, as in my case, I've been told I have to call El Paso to talk to somebody in Matamoros. So it's easier for me to just say, I'm gonna take some, a leave of absence for about 48 hours. I'm gonna to go to Matamoros and talk to the people I need to talk to, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. They tell their people I'm going fishing in Brownsville so that they can come and have lunch with us and talk about what's going on over there. So there's a disconnect, mm -hmm. again, in Washington about what's going on. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know if it's because we're not loud enough or because, I'll say, I don't know. We need to do something about it, but I don't know what. Mm -hmm. Manuel, Perhaps any ideas? We can do something. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Paula. Uh, four years ago, I was invited to Princeton uh, to the Educational Testing Service. Uh, that's almost like sleeping with the enemy for Latinos. <laughs> but uh, I was asked to do some questions for the ACT, SAT, GRE. Uh, exams because they had virtually nothing along the border, nothing about Mexicanos and Mexicanos, nothing about Tejanos. So what I would do, I would go to ET, uh, uh, ETS, then go to the Firestone Library uh, and document the questions I was writing and then, uh, and they were like thrilled because not one of the historians had any knowledge of, or very little knowledge of Mexican Americans in South Texas. It was like an epiphany that we actually existed and that we actually had a history and an identity. So there is a confluence as we live along the border. I mean, uh, it's always been that confluence. Uh, but it's also, uh, for a long period of time, uh, people see San Antonio as the, as the bottom of Texas. Uh, and and uh, we need to make uh, institutions like our institution in Pan American and the kind of things that are happening on campus and then uh, this uh, institution that's coming up in two or three years or evidence that finally people are listening. Uh, but we need to uh, become more active, uh, you as community and, and as students in the community. Uh, you need to know what your kids read in textbooks. You need to know what your kids eat in school. You need to know what, uh, what kinds of things are uh, said or not said about the community, because the only way you can make it better is to defend it. Manuel, you, you raise a great point about the future of education in this area. And we're fortunate to have Miriam, who is still a student, and Monica, who has a dual role, a foot in both camps, instructor at, at a community college, but also a graduate student in the doctoral program. Uh, what about this new regional university? How is that, is that a natural evolution in the development of Latinos in, in Texas and the United States? How does that, the creation of this new emerging research institution, which will be uh, the second largest Hispanic serving institution in the nation, how is that gonna change the landscape here? Monica, why don't you go first? Well, um, it's, it's funny because I went to uh, an international conference in Washington a couple of years ago, and, uh, and I told uh, the, the people who I was uh, 
kind of meeting with. I, I said, yeah, I teach uh, students who currently live in Mexico and travel pretty much every day. And they said, what? You, you teach people who live in Mexico? How is that? We teach people who live in a different city, not in, from a different country. And I said, yeah, it's, it's a little different. And they said, well, how so? And I said, well, there's many factors that go into play. So um, I think it just kind of changes the culture of things. You really have to understand both sides of the border for you to have a clear balance for effective communication when it comes to your studies or when it comes to uh, being effective business person. So just kind of understanding the American culture, understanding the Mexican culture, and then finding a medium to kind of deal with it. So when do I play the American side more? When do I play the Mexican side more? So um, I'm currently in a, in a doctoral program, and my cohort, there's about, there's about 16 of us, and most of us are Mexican, or Mexican-American. And uh, just the interactions that we have with each other, we, we kind of understand each other a lot more. We're a lot more collectivistic when it comes to our families and our careers than other doctoral programs are where, um, you know, they, they, they're they very individualistic. They care more about, um, or they make decisions based on themselves before their groups. So it's, it's just a, a different field when it comes to those aspects, but yeah. Miriam, your thoughts? Well, I agree with Ms. Mercado. I think that it's really important, really great that we have a university here. I feel like the um, from the video we had the New Mexicans who went off to get educated and they came back to protect their land. So I think it's really important that we get educated and then when some of us come back and protect our land and get to really represent ourselves in other places and we have the ability to do so. So I think it's important that we have a university down here and we should keep it that way. <laughs> One of the uh, founding principles of the emerging university is to produce a student that is bicultural, it's biliterate, who can excel and serve, and who can exist, excel in two worlds. Manuel, what do you think about that as a vision that's actually in print, that's actually something that's come down from UT system, for example? 20 years ago, that would have been unimaginable. Sure, um, if I were in this, room 50 years ago, most of the audience would be men. Mm -hmm. So right away, you see a, a paradigm shift in terms of who's attending college. And right now, 60% of my students, I believe, are women. Mm -hmm. So that tells you a lot right off the bat about how things are changing. Um, in most communities in Europe, being multicultural, multilingual is an advantage. Uh, for a long time, the United States has been very monolistic uh, and monolingual and be, been very proud of it. Uh, living along any border between two countries, we realize that not only do you have to know the language, you have to know the people, you have to know the community, you have to know the history. And so if we can do that at this institution and other institutions like UT El Paso and other border institutions, we can set the model in a lot of ways for what other institutions across the country can do because the Latino population is exploding. That's, that's mm -hmm. no great news. And Latinos are not just in the Southwest, the majority are in the Southwest, but they're everywhere. And so in order to address some of their needs, educational needs, social needs, political needs, economic needs, we have to know the population. And, and that's part of uh, that knowledge, uh, being bicultural, biliterate, and, and uh, embracing the idea that, uh, that there are a lot of us with different ethnicities, uh, of different races, of different religions, we're all in this together, and that's important. Mm -hmm. Paula, as someone who spends so much time working in the community, what's the community's role, as you think of it, as we begin to move towards creating this new university? And I'll get off this topic in just a second, but I'm just curious. I don't think that the community in general understands it. Okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of muddy. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little muddy for us too. Yeah, I, get, I can imagine. Um, I don't think, you know, they're, the concerns of the community are, what's gonna happen with tuition? Is it gonna go up? Um, what's gonna happen? Are we gonna get taxed more or not? And are our kids going to get a quality education or not? Those are the questions that I hear. 
Um, do they understand what it means to have a regional university? No. Mm. It's not there. Right. I, I mean, I, and I have to tell you, I'm, I sort of have an idea yeah. of what it might look like, but um, how it would work, I have no clue. Yeah. None of us do. We'll figure it out, though. <laughs> but that's a great insight. And those are very fair questions that need to be addressed at some point. Let me open it up to some questions from the audience. What did you all think about the documentary? I asked earlier why you're here. Now that you've seen the documentary, you've thought about it a little bit. Why are you here? Yes, sir. I'm not sure exactly who it was on the panel who mentioned it, but someone made the very good point that it's not really talked about in the world. Hispanic, Latino culture, it's always talked about other minority groups. And for someone who comes from two minority groups, myself, Latino and African American, my African American history is always propelled into me in the history books, in classrooms, and in the educational system, but never my Latino side. So to come here, it was beyond inspiring to see that it wasn't just the African-Americans that were lynched, it was also the Latinos and other uh, factual information. So uh, it was an honor to be here, so uh, thank you all. Anyone else? Yes. Mm -hmm. In order to educate others, we need to understand our own culture ourselves. And many of us here aren't aware of where we come from. You know, we have an idea, but we don't really know about it. How can we, you know, you guys, how do you guys think we can educate our students, us, and, and you know, have us have knowledge of what we're going to educate others? Because without it, we can't teach what we don't know. I guess the irony of that question, Lorena, is uh, sometimes if we don't know our own history, we can't pass it on. And so uh, one of the things that's under duress, uh, under attack across the country is ethnic, study, ethnic studies courses about minorities, uh, which is ironic at a time that we probably need them the most to understand uh, which is a burgeoning Latino community. So I still think it begins in the educational arena. Uh, we need, need to expand the courses. Uh, we need to have people of a generation that knows enough about themselves to sit down with their children and let them know who they are. Who's next? Maria Saldana, I'm with uh, UFW. I represent farm workers. Mm -hmm. All right, buddy. Yeah, farm workers. My question mm -hmm. is, ¿cuándo olvidamos el idioma? Ya no sabemos comunicarnos totalmente. Todo tiene que ser inglés y es una injusticia para la persona que no comprende el inglés, para la persona que no sabe comunicar el español. ¿Qué podemos hacer para solucionar ese problema? Parte de eso empieza en la casa, pero muchas veces la generación de presente no sabe suficiente español para presentar a, a su familia. You know, we live, uh, we sort of skip the generation. Uh, I know that, uh, and I'm not the only one in here, I know you're one of them as well. Uh, I grew up in a generation where speaking Spanish was bad, <laughs> eating Mexican food was bad, uh, being punished after school for speaking Spanish was uh, done, in, it, yeah, well, it became an art, and sometimes by Mexican-American teachers. They were the worst offenders. So there was a generation of us that, that, that thought, we are going to teach our students only English because of what we had gone through. And, and that generation, the present generation, has to be taught um, through, certainly beginning at a very early age in, in their schooling. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with uh, parents 
uh, learning the language themselves. A lot of our present generation, I can tell you right now that most of you that are Hispanic in here know less Spanish than your grandparents and less Spanish than your parents, and yet your children are gonna learn less Spanish than you. And yet what markets you as Hispanic uh, graduates is being bilingual, biliterate, and understanding the cultures. That's what's gonna market you. When everything else is equal, you know, GPAs and everything else, you're gonna have to know that. So it's incumbent upon you to learn it, you know, and, and we're bombarded by everything in English, commercials, advertising, music. So it's gotta come from within, decide, I wanna know my grandmother's language. Question two, mm -hmm. on uh, immigration reform, because we're working very hard on immigration reform, and we're getting a lot of political backtrack on that. Even our voting rights are endangered at this time. What is your opinion on that, Dr. Medrano? Me? Okay. Uh, well, you know, uh, the struggle, you know, one of the things, for example, that you'll see in uh, the, one of the later episodes is about uh, uh, the Sister Chavez, uh, um, the kind of work he did, not only to organize uh, the farm workers in California, but also become a civil rights leader. Well, Tony Orendine had that uh, uh, reputation down here. Uh, it's something that you have to emphasize at a very early age, that as citizens of this country, you know, the only thing, that our biggest voice is our vote. And so when that is threatened, then we have to speak out against it. And we have to do it, not just the people that are the farm workers, but the people that are the educators, the people that are the lawyers, the people that are the doctors, because it has to be a united front to do this. I mean, uh, You'll see in, in episode three about how the poll taxes, for example, how grandfather clauses, how all sorts of things kept people from voting, right? And to me, that's, that's history. There shouldn't be that. But there's all sorts of things like zoning and other things that prevent people. And sometimes just the way the polls are set up that people are, feel intimidated uh, uh, to vote. And, so, and, and that's your right. If you're a citizen of this country, you need to vote and, and take it seriously and regrettably not only here, but throughout the country, we take it very lightly. Mm -hmm. And so part of what we need to do is, if we have the vote, first of all, we have to get it and maintain it. And secondly, we have to use it. Because all these things that we're talking about for Latinos, education, health, politics, uh, jobs, all these things have to do with how much clout you can have at the polls to pressure the people in politics to make changes. Complaining about things to each other, maybe <laughs> will make us feel better, but it won't make changes. That's a great point, Manuel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Monica, you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, yeah going back to the uh, language argument, I kind of just wanted to say that um, as a culture, we kind of have to embrace our traditions and our language. I always tell my students, because it's a common thing that you hear in America, right? Speak English, you're in America. I mean, how many of you have heard it before? It's a common saying. But America, uh, English isn't a set language, so we kind of have to make the rules and rewrite them a little bit, especially when it comes to higher institution. Uh, thankfully, I was part of a graduate course that kind of embraced both of the cultures, so we did have that text next aspect to it. And it was really interesting just to see the dynamic that took place. Um, I speak Spanish and I speak English also. I don't speak that um, effective Spanish, like Dr. Medrano was saying, but um, I do try, and uh, it, it was just a really good experience that I had, and I wish that we kind of embraced that as well. Um, when I was teaching at Pan American, I, there was, it, was a, it was kind of a little complex or a struggle that went on in the theater program because nobody wanted to produce or nobody wanted to direct Mexican-American plays, and um, we kind of always tried to get, you know, people to direct them, and they said, no, no one will come. And I said, of course they will. As long as we stay strong with our culture, with our heritage, and we kind of embrace it, then, then we'll, we'll make it as strong and effective as it should be, so. I'd like to follow up on the language thread a little bit more. Paula, what's your experience dealing with the community, the kinds of tensions that revolve around language, the need to retain the original language, yet the need to acquire skills in, in the official, quote unquote, it's not official, but for all, in terms of 
so much, so much of the paperwork that we have to fill out, so much of the, the political terrain we, they have to navigate. What's that tension in the community? The, uh, there is a huge concern mm -hmm. because we have a, an aging population that speaks primarily Spanish, at least in the population that I serve. And uh, we have to have a bilingual, bicultural staff. Uh, it, it's required, but even then, uh, you know, you can test just so much in an interview, and then the real test comes when they're actually dealing with the patients. Uh, there are differences. There are cultural differences and different words for the same thing, and each word has a different meaning. Even though you may think you're saying it correctly, you may not be. Um, we have physicians from all over the world that are probably better at speaking Spanish than many of our own uh, staff that are from here. Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna share with you a, a, a conversation I had with um, uh, Dr. Garcia, the president of uh, UT Brownsville, some years ago. And we were discussing the, the, the situation of how do you how do you become fluent in Spanish when you are trying to carry in a conversation totally in Spanish and not in Tex-Mex? Because that is a problem. And uh, we determined that probably the best way to do that would be to listen to Spanish radio. Um, and the reason for that is that it's a song the language, any language, is a song. And if you can pick up the song, the words will come naturally. If you do that once, once a day, at least for an hour, half an hour going to school or to work and half an hour going home, uh, you can become fairly fluent fairly, fairly uh, fast. So, you know, when you talk about how do you learn English when it's not your first language, you do it the same way. I've had people that have come from Egypt, from India, from you know other parts of the, the Philippines, and they tell me the same thing. They immerse themselves by watching TV, and so do their um, family members, and they become fluent fairly, fairly fast. So it, we have to learn both languages if we're going to survive in this world. You know, we are, I think, you know, uh, the silent majority and have been for years and years and years. Uh, I don't know why they call us a minority, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, it's, it's like Dr. Medrano said, anywhere else you go in the world, mm -hmm. people are multilingual. And, and we spend a lot of energy fighting for something that, in fact, we should say to ourselves, you know what, I've got to learn more languages than just one. Uh, that's my opinion. It's my humble opinion. Well, it's a, it's a great observation because, like you point out, the world is multilingual. In many ways, we're trying to catch up from that cultural perspective. We need to overcome, and that's, when I say we, I mean North America. That's well, America and Canada is very, very bilingual, if not more. We need to overcome that anxiety, that fear that somehow learning more than one language knowing, experiencing more than one culture, somehow uh, intruding upon th this idea of purity that's touched upon in the, in the documentary. I think that's one of the things that's defined uh, United States culture now for the last 200 plus years is the, is the idea of racial purity and that anything that deviates from that is kind of an assault on the integrity of that ideal. But as we move into this a global uh, marketplace, a global economy, a global international experience in our everyday lives, it's become a liability to be insulated as such. If I can yeah. go back real mm -hmm. quick to the immigration issue. I think first, um, immigration has been around for since the beginning. Um, it's been formed by immigration. And I think one of, the, or migration, one of the important things that we need to do is understand our self-worth. Um, the truth is that the co this country needs us more than probably more than we need them. So to know really what we contribute to this country would really help us fight for 
our rights that are important, that we're important, and we really do give so much to this country, so we need to know that. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, good night. Uh, my name is Angelica Luna. I'm a graduate student here at UT Brownsville, and I have a couple of comments in regards to what people have been talking about here. Uh, first of all, um, just a little bit of background so you can understand where I'm coming from. It's, I, was, I was born here, um, studied essentially all my life here in the United States, but I always lived in Mexico. My mom's from over there and all my family, most of my family's from there. Um, and growing up, there was a lot of, uh, I don't want to say like identity, um, loss of identity because essentially when I came to school, as um, some of the people in the board mentioned, you, you were told to speak English because you're here, you have to learn English. The subjects, is, everything's in English. Um, and then they started this thing about being bilingual and they put you in this bilingual program. So if you didn't ha know English, um, you can essentially start learning and still learn, um, understand the context in Spanish. Um, and I was supposed to go into that program. Um, but after talking to the principal, I told him, how am I gonna learn a language correctly if I don't practice it? Um, and it's going back to the communication and the, you know, the generations that don't understand English and that live here. Um, how are you gonna learn it if you don't practice it? And I think maybe sometimes even within our culture, you know, there are subcultures, and we discriminate each other. Uh, I, I saw it, and I experienced it myself when I was in school, and I can even see it in the university level. You can see how students who are more in, in contact with their Mexican, Hispanic, Latino side um, group together, and those who identify more with the American side group together, and they really, Sometimes, well, maybe more in the university they'll, they'll mix, but not when they're growing up. And um, my point, uh, the point is, it's important for us to unite as Hispanics, as Latinos, and to accept each other and understand that even though we come from different backgrounds, we might be like first generation, second generation, or third generation living in this country, we essentially are the same. And uh, we need first to embrace that in, other, in, other, in order for other people to embrace that also. So that was my comment. My secret life is spent as a scholar of science fiction, so I'm interested in the future. Where are we going? Where do you see Latinos 20 years from now, 50 years from now? Paula, I'll start with you, and we'll, we'll come down this road. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we were, were 50 tell. years ago. So, yeah. um, I think, I think in, in 20 years, we're going to uh, probably be more vocal. I think that we're going to get our act together a little bit better. I think in 50 years, we will... Um, probably do more in the, in the world than we do now. I don't think it's gonna take very long. We're actually in a very good place to do that mm -hmm. because at least along the border, those of us that grew up here embrace at least two cultures. And if we can embrace two cultures, we can certainly embrace more and, and take the lead economically and otherwise. Manuel, your thoughts? On sure. the future? Uh, uh, as of July this year, or last year, 2012, uh, Hispanics numbered over 53 million population. And uh, that's 17% 70 70 of the general population of the states. That's a sizable group. Uh, what that tells us is uh, that the kinds of things that are going to occur if we decide to be vocal and support them and get an education, we'll have to focus on things that haven't been focused before. Uh, there was a, an acquaintance of mine, his name um, is Carlos Vélez Ibáñez, who in 1996 wrote a book called Border Visions. One of the chapters in that book is entitled Distribution of Sadness, Poverty, Crime, Drugs, 
illness and war. And he said, those issues can only be addressed by education, period. There's no other way around it. And he has a lot of statistics pointing to that. And this is, this is years ago that this book was published. Well, the reality is that yes, uh, sometimes as we point to census figures and, and the Department of Education figures, uh, the number of dropouts uh, is decreasing. The number of graduates is increasing, but the population is booming. And it's not so much getting out of high school and college, it's getting the kind of education in high school that'll get you to college and allow you to be successful and the kind of college education that'll get you a job right away. One of the things that's very real among those college graduates today is that there's almost a lull of a year to two years before they find a real job. And something has to change. And the only way that changes is deciding that uh, among the students that they need to uh, be given the kind of worth that they deserve. As you mentioned earlier, Paula, and, and you mentioned Miriam, uh, what we've given to the country is a tremendous amount. Regrettably, it's not in our history books, it's not in our literature books, and so we have to know it to present it. We have to know it. And uh, I think once the, the general population knows it, I think the respect for Latinos, the attention to Latinos, and the attention to Latinos' issues will increase. But we have to be the catalyst for that change. Thank you. Miriam? Well, I agree as well. I think that if we take the opportunity of the time now, we're in a very important time. I think they're beginning to see that we have a lot of influence. For example, the last election really proved to many people the influence that the Latino population has, as well as immigration reform. It's one of the biggest topics because we're finally using our voice. So I see a bright future, and I see it I, if we continue to do so, and we continue to fight for our rights and really let them know that we're here, um, it, I see good things. Mm -hmm. Monica? I think um, as a minority, we're going to be valued a lot more. Um, and I see a lot of people, you know, the valley becoming a lot more diverse. You saw a large majority of people that lived here who were Mexican-American. And now it's we're getting people from all over the world, and they're kind of just also valuing the, um, or appreciating our bilingual status and just kind of the traditions that we keep. Um, I, I have a friend and she's from New York and she lives down here, she does business and she tells me, she says, gosh, you gotta teach me Spanish, it's gonna be one of the most important languages and I need to know it. And I said, okay, so, so what did you learn in high school? She said, you know, they taught us the basic stuff. And I said, okay, what's the basic? She said, we saw the movie Selena and we were supposed to learn from that. <laughs> and I said, oh gosh, yeah, we, we um, but we have come a long way, right? So Spanish is a lot more valued. Our culture is a lot more valued. And I just see that progressing in the next coming years. So mm -hmm. I'm, I, hope to, I hope to see that grow. Yeah, I'll add one more comment. Sure. Uh, we don't want to become complacent. Sometimes we sit in our laurels and sit in our identity and sit in our culture and say, well, you know, we've arrived, we were here. You have to be active. You have to be agents of change. And you, the people that you're at the top of the pyramid, the fact that you're in here as students and are gonna become professionals, people will listen to you, right? But you have to know who you are and what you're talking about. Because that crosses ethnicities, it crosses races. You can be, African-American, you can be Italian, you can be Mexicano, right? If you're not a good accountant, you're gonna get fired. <laughs> I'm a realist, as well as a science fiction scholar. I think that's a pretty good place to end this evening. Thank you, panelists, for you know, discussing some of these issues, and they're rich and complex and varied. I think we've gone some ways towards solving all our world problems tonight, but we'll continue over the course of the semester in your classes and in the, in the years to come. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. And thank you, KMBH. <laughs>